today, October 3rd, 2009, I, Farah Dabogo, overall field commander for the movement for the emancipation of the Niger that I met, accept together with field commanders in River State the presidential offer of amnesty to militants which pull it down their weapons. I and my people, we accept the amnesty. The arms have been surrendered. Today, 4th October, year of our Lord, 2009, will mark the beginning of the development of the Niger Delta region. The promises have been made. And now, the challenge to silence the guns permanently in the Niger Delta region is just beginning. It's a challenge successive governments have tried but failed to overcome. It's a challenge this president has committed to confront. It's the challenge of the development of the Niger Delta. October 4th, 2009. Dateline, Oporosa, headquarter of Baramat Kingdom. It's just a few hours to the expiration of the president's amnesty for militants in the Niger Delta. Having embraced the amnesty deal the previous day, the most dreaded militant in the region, Tom Polo, chose to turn in his arms. You can see she we do hope that the government and our fathers in government will play their part so that posterity will not find us wanting. Virtually all the ex-militants in the region echoed the same message when they were laying down their arms. The good news is the government has always known this, but the bad news is that it has always failed to match words with action. This time though, the man who oversees the amnesty program says things will be different. It is a process and it will take some time. But I want to assure you that everybody involved, right from Mr. President himself, is committed to ensuring that we do not fail you. <laughs> Though the government has not yet released any comprehensive post-amnesty plan, it has its job already cut out for it. The people say they want federal presence in the region. Federal presence means one thing, development. Let us develop the Niger Delta. If they can develop the Niger Delta, there will not be problem. For the people of Baramat Kingdom, that development would mean rebuilding communities that were destroyed by the military during the crisis. The development will also mean addressing the seeming paradox that the Niger Delta region has become. Egwa Oye flow station has been in existence since 1967. Timi showed me a good example. The Egwa flow station right in the heart of Baramati Kingdom. Egwa flow station produces more than 10,000 barrels per day, over 10,000 barrels per day. The flow station, it has lights, water and everything, but the immediate community people, they don't have lights and water. The people, what they, they, the water they get is from the oil well. It is a water well, it is not a oil well. The water well that supplies the flow station got bad. And uh, there is a, the water is flowing out. It's not, it, it, ordinarily, it's not supposed to be good for drinking. Okay. But the people are getting water from this one. It's an all too familiar story that runs across the length and breadth of a region that produces at least 90% of the country's wealth. The local people see oil wells scattered on their rivers and creeks, but they do not have a say in terms of how the money from the oil is spent. Well, right behind me there are the oil wells. There are several of them scattered all over Guaramatu Kingdom, all of them producing thousands of barrels of oil per day. Now, thousands of barrels of oil per day will translate to thousands or millions of dollars. But unfortunately, these millions of dollars have not in any way contributed to the development of this area. Beyond all this, however, the government must come up fast with a watertight idea of what to do with the hundreds of thousands of youth in the area who are jobless, especially those who have just laid down their arms. The government says it intends to send those who wish to school and provide skill acquisition training for others. But recent protests by some of the boys over on paid allowances for the amnesty program 
is now raising serious concerns whether the majority of the boys actually buy into the idea of schooling or skill acquisition. Perhaps when all of that has been taken care of, then will the government begin to find answers as to how all the huge cache of arms and ammunition turned in by the former militants found their way into a country that is not at war. Already the situation is giving some highly placed government officials, like the River State Governor, a cause for concern. My reaction was that what, what were we doing? How did we get here? What was the security doing that they could let these kind of weapons enter into the country on an 